Well, good morning, everybody, and it's really fab to be back with you. Um, before we start the service, I am going to welcome you, but I am going to say that I bring love from St John's and I have returned your love to them because I knew you would want me to do. Also, um, I welcome to walkers who were Andy and Amy, um, who they were just walking by and they've come in this morning to join us for our service. So, uh, Welcome everybody to this morning communion, which is, of course, during a period of mourning. Are we working? Are we nearly working? I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. We meet in the name of Jesus Christ, who died and was raised to the glory of God the Father. Grace and mercy be with you and also with you. So we stand to sing our song, The Kingdom of God is Justice and Joy. Almighty God, who judge us in infinite mercy and justice and love everything you have made in your mercy, turn the darkness of death into the dawn of new life and the sorrow of parting into the joy of heaven. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Together we say, God has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of his glory and in the face of Christ. But we have treasure in those and to show that the trans... 
power belongs to God and not to us. As we acknowledge our human frailty, we call to mind our sins of word, deed and omission and confess them before God our Father. You raise the dead to life in spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You bring pardon and peace to the broken in heart. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You make one by your spirit the torn and divided. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May God our Father forgive us our sins and bring us to the eternal joy of his kingdom where dust and ashes have no dominion. Amen. Merciful Father and Lord of all life, we praise you that you, we are made in your image and reflect your truth and light. We thank you for the life of our late Sovereign Lady Queen Elizabeth, for the love she received from you and showed amongst us. Above all, we rejoice at your gracious promise to all your servants, living and departed, that we shall rise again at the coming of Christ. And we ask that in due time, we may share with your servant Elizabeth that clearer vision, promised to us in the same Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we bless your holy name for all that you have given to us in and through the life of your servant, Elizabeth, our Queen. We give you thanks for her love of family and her gift of friendship, for her devotion to this nation and the nations of the Commonwealth, for her grace, dignity, and courtesy, and for her generosity and love of life. We praise you for the courage she has shown in testing times, the depth of her Christian faith, and the witness she bore to it in word and deed. We pray for our sovereign Lord the King and all the royal family that you might reassure them of your continuing love and lift them from the depths of grief into the peace and light of your presence. 
Amen. Can I add my welcome to those who are visiting us today? Um, it's, it's lovely to have you in church this week. And to say that next week, as well as this week, obviously having prayers and marking uh, the loss of our Queen, um, next week will be a special commemorative service, as will happen across many of the churches in the Church of England, and you're welcome to return for that. As we hold on to that um, double-sided change that's happened, that Queen Elizabeth II has died, and that King Charles III is now king. And we're often called to hold many things in tension, both joy and sorrow, and that's part of what a time of mourning is about. Um, and because people do need to meet and connect, we're still going ahead with TOTS this week. Uh, TOTS is restarting in the community centre on Tuesday and has already restarted last week on a Wednesday at St. John's. But Messy Church is going to be postponed until October, and the encouragement is for people to come here and share in the commemorative service. Next week also is the Sunday that is closest to Bill having his 90th birthday, which still will happen and still will be a time of celebration for us. So we're going to have a bring and share lunch for that as well, and that sort of... that commitment for us in the Judeo-Christian faith that we weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice and for Paul Charles who is both uh, crowned as king and taken on a new role but also grieving for his mother we pray deeply um, let's pray father for all those who weep and mourn for all those who rejoice and celebrate be close with them today and especially with the royal family amen Now we have our first reading. I understand. Is it you, Jill? Romans 14, please. Thank you. So well I am. <laughs> <laughs> this morning's reading is Romans 14, the weak and the strong. Except the one whose faith is weak, without quarrelling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat anything must ju not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master servant stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt for we all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. 
Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat, because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we stand for our next song? Jesus is King and I will extol him. <clears throat>
Please remain standing for our gospel reading. Hear the gospel of our Lord according to Luke. The parable of the lost sheep, chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Father God, we thank you for this chance to come and to remember and give thanks for the life of Queen Elizabeth II but also to learn at your feet about how we live our lives in the world. Send your spirit on us now that you may speak to our hearts and our souls, our minds and our lives. Amen. Amen. Please sit. Some of you may well have personal memories of the Queen. For me, I don't. Uh, I've never been in the privilege of having that uh, opportunity to meet her. Um, the closest I've ever got to royalty was at a distance in, um, in Salford Keys. Where I was walking through Salford Keys, there was a crowd, and I could just see the top of Prince William's head. Um, and that's about as close as I've ever, I've ever gotten to royalty. But we have heard an awful lot of people sharing their memories and their thoughts, some of them extremely personally, and who wasn't moved by Prince Charles saying publicly thank you to his mama as she goes now to take her final journey to be with Papa. Others from much more of a formal point of view, but a number of them picking up that the Queen was a great figure for unity in this country, across the Commonwealth, and in the way she connected as a head of state um, across peoples of very diverse uh, groups uh, and, and persuasions. And uh, she did that role uh, pretty well, I think, is, is, is the consensus, uh, as she was able to do that, but not get involved directly or politically. And it's one of the arguments for what we have in a constitutional mon monarchy uh, where they're not political, uh, a bit like the head uh, or the, 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 the person who in the House of Commons is the speaker and their job is not to be one side or the other of the politics, but to facilitate that great connection and unity between each other. And that's a really important move because there's two uh, two, two pressures at work and predominantly the reading we had today is about that pressure for unity whereas the other pressure is the pressure to split and to divide over issues 
I come from Stoke on Trent, and I've said this before that there was a, a Pentecostal minister who looked at Stoke on Trent, and it's quite a large collaboration, but it doesn't have any large churches. So he looked at them and sort of scratched his head and tried to reason out why it was that it didn't have any large churches. And his conclusion in the end was that it suffered from the Protestant malaise. And wherever there was two or three families, they would split into three or four churches. And when you look around Stoke, there are just thousands of small churches and chapels and other things. But that sort of tendency of us to divide, and um, that does find some basis in that we're supposed to stand by the truth and potentially have nothing to do with people who are wicked. But Paul today is writing about something very, very different. And that is the, the opposing force of the, the, the forces that bind us together into unity. As he's spoken a lot in the letter of Romans about God's grace, God's sovereignty, and God's mercy to us, and the love that we should share with one another. In fact, he's also talked a number of times about the fact that we shouldn't judge one another, and that is part of what helps us to find unity. And that unity that he's talking about is the unity that comes in diversity, not in a single voice. We all know in a political sense about the unity of a single voice, and we see it in Russia with dictatorships, where nobody else is allowed to dissent. But part of our political landscape is that we actually have and value the honoured opposition. And actually, that's not just between political parties, but actually even within a political party. We've just had uh, the election of our new prime minister, and that came after some quite acrimonious hustings where people put different points of view. And now what they're arguing for is that the Conservative Party has to find unity. And it's not just the Conservative Party. The same was true when Labour uh, was electing uh, a new um, leader. And the same is true in the church, which has divided into lots and lots of different denominations, lots and lots of different churches, and even within churches, pressures to divide and to separate. And Paul gives a number of pointers about how to find unity. The first of those pointers is that we have a higher purpose. Now, in politics, that may be the higher purpose is, uh, for, from a humanist perspective, society to self-actualize, democracy uh, to be spread, and others to join in the great benefits of democracy. For us as Christians, uh, the great the unifying factor is that Jesus has come and lived amongst us as God in the midst of us. And his love went to the cross for us, died for us, burst from the tomb, offering us new life. And that is the thing that unifies us by God's grace, embracing us and drawing us into a new family. And though at Christmas, or actually any other week, we may be divided over certain issues, like the family around the Christmas table arguing about politics or the Queen's speech, we have a greater unity found in Jesus and he is the Lord. And so Paul starts in talking to a church that is divided by saying, don't judge one another. Because when you judge one another, you put yourself above them. You put themself actually in God's position. And technically, from the Christian point of view, that's idolatry. You put yourself where God should be and take his position in judgment. And you shouldn't do that. It's for God to sort that out. It's in politics, uh, the belief that actually the, uh, the votes that happen from the people, uh, the corporate mind will be the thing that sorts that out and moves things forward into the future. And that together we will work out our way in all our discussions to achieve the future that we're called to. We believe in something greater and that's the source of unity. And we have to leave certain things as not in our control but under that greater authority uh, and find unity in that. Paul is writing from fairly bitter personal experience. Both the experience of the church, which I'll summarise quite briefly as it was probably planted by Peter in Rome in the centre of the Roman Empire, a new faith emerging at the heart of a dominant and very forceful political power. 
And as it emerged, um, predominantly in the Jewish community, um, we see in Paul's letters, and we can expect that it was similar uh, for Peter in Rome, the emergence of conflict. And actually, under the previous emperor, that conflict is thought to be what led to the Jews being banished out of Rome, which left a Roman church developing as a few Gentiles left behind, all the Jews expelled out, them developing probably in their own small groups, their own small churches, coming under the influence of Peter and Paul and many other Christian teachers. Then eventually, when the Roman emperor um, died, being allowed to return to Rome and finding that they developed slightly differently. And how did they now find unity in their difference? A question that I've hinted at before, political parties at all persuasions have had as, they, as they've gone through um, various hustings as well. And in many situations, a family might have to do that. If a family has gone through a deep and heartbreaking argument that split a family, and then they're trying to build those bridges. And they need to find something higher that unites them. On the political front, it's, it's the ideal of democracy. And in the church, it is Jesus who is Lord. And that is what connects us. And so we have to leave a certain space for others to be different. Does this mean that we have to accept them completely as they are and not have any views on anything? No, Paul is not arguing for that. But he argues that we should each seek to understand um, what we believe and live it out. In fact, I think Paul would go a little bit farther rather than it just being about the head. We should each seek to know God better and how we live that out in the world. We should each seek to be the best version of ourselves that we can be. And this connects it with this section of Romans which starts off that our worship, and in our worship involves finding our place in the world and living it out to the best of our ability a couple of chapters earlier. Listen to the earlier sermon. I think that got recorded and put onto our Facebook page if you want to follow that one some more. And so each of us has a duty to diligently search and find the best version uh, that we can find, the best understanding that we can find. But while equally, Paul has said earlier in Romans and elsewhere in Corinth, in Corinth he puts it easier, that, we, that now we see through a glass dimly. It's like seeing through dirty stained glass windows and you don't quite see what's beyond. We've got to try to see the best we can, but we will see more clearly when we see God. In the end, these things will be sorted out and we've just got to trust that that part of the way of getting there is by our due diligence. But also allow other people to do that as well. So how do we treat those that we disagree with? Well, Paul can be read in two ways, as he's saying here. The first way that I think is wrong is to have Paul going. We've each got to do it. In the end, God will tell us, and God will show them that they're wrong. And that could be one way you say strong and weak and how he is talking. Don't think that's actually quite Paul. Because Paul, from his experience, has always lived in a society that has had many different groups and factions. He grew up in Tarsus, which was a major, major centre for Greek philosophy. And you can see in his writing that he was very versed in it and had people arguing this way and that. He then trained as a rabbi. And in the rabbinic training, there were different subgroups that argued with one another. And then he came to faith in Jesus, but only after he had been pure persecuting those who were different to him. And in his persecution of those who were different to him, he held the cloaks of those who were stoning Stephen to death, and then took letters of introduction to go to Damascus to arrest even more. And he had an experience of Jesus, and that changed him. And that experience meant that he started to live a new life. And knowing that God can change people, part of his belief in this argument is that God can change their minds, or my mind. And it has both that conviction that when I've searched out what I believe to be true, I will live that out in the world, trying to make the world a better place. And equally, I might come to a revelation 
that shows me something better. And so I'm not going to be judgmental on others. And I'm certainly not going to get back to being involved in stoning people that disagree with me. And perhaps in our world, that's... I'm going to sort of... When we come to our next election in a couple of years' time, I'm going to diligently read through all the manifestos of the different parties. If you don't already belong to a party, and it's not already decided how you'll vote. Uh, and then I'm going to make the best decision I can, and I'm actually going to turn up at the election and have my votes. I'm not going to be in absence. But I will be open to political debate and for other people having different opinions. And I won't cancel them on Facebook or wherever I go onto the internet if I disagree with them. Because actually, I think there is space for that freedom of speech and everybody to have their own opinion. So Paul goes through this long argument that we read through about whether you eat meat or whether you don't eat meat and how you live. And he's not talking about modern day vegetarianism, uh, though that is a debate to be had about how much meat we should eat and whether we should eat less meat and whether we should eat no meat. And there, there is a debate in society that should be had there. But he is writing to a community living at the heart of a different religion, the Roman gods, having their temples in Rome. And the meat that has been sacrificed in the temple makes its way into the avatars and is sold in the marketplace. And that question that each Christian had to face of, is it okay for me to eat that meat because God's made everything? Or because it's been sacrificed to other gods, does that mean that I should keep away from it just to sow my separation, that I belong to something different and a different identification? And Paul came clearly that he sides on one side, but wants to accept those who are on the other. And that means that we've got a choice about how we live together. And that choice together is about accepting, in some ways, that there's people who are different. Whoever has had that conversation with you, mum, don't bait, bait Uncle Tom and start about whatever it might be. The state, of the, the, the state of the Bank of England or whatever that debate might have been that we had at Christmas and you knew that you could bait your uncle into an argument. It says live peaceably with others and so therefore if they're a vegetarian, if they're a vegan like my daughter-in-law, you don't serve them chicken sachet or beef bourguignon. You just don't do that to them. That's not loving. Because a loving society has freedom of speech and accepts people of different positions. A loving church accepts that people, as they're faithfully trying to follow Jesus, may have different opinions. When I was a teenager, I used to think, Phew, they're just nominal Christians or whatever. But actually, respects that they are equally seeking to follow Jesus. And it actually not only comes under authority, but heads in a direction. And that's would have been next week's sermon, except we're changing the readings, obviously, for the service of commemoration, where it talks about the ultimate destiny that Paul is seeing for a fractured church in Rome that he's writing to is that the ultimate destiny we see ourselves getting to from the Christian perspective is one of all the nations being united in worship, united in giving worth to God, united in living out a life that is authentically human, and authentically human, showing God into the world and making the world a better place. And that means we're going to live, if that's our ultimate destiny, in an eternity that has people of different nations with different preferences on music and how to do things, but united under one God. And obviously I'll let those who may be here because they're here to remember the Queen, to put that into your own context, whether that's political or otherwise. But overall, we have some wisdom that combating the, the powers that would seek to divide us, there can be forces that will unite us if we can find a higher purpose, if we can diligently strive to understand and do what we believe is right, but with a degree of humility 
that accepts people who are different and the possibility that we may be wrong. And we can find a way of lovingly living that out in a way that builds bridges and connections to others without being offensive to them. And I believe that these are some of the things that the Queen both believed, as you listen to her um, Christmas Day um, speeches, and you heard her faith coming out there, and I believe it's the things that she exemplified in the world that helped her to be seen as a person who brought unity. And it's perhaps something that we can all take from her and live out in the world as we seek to be people who are driven by a force that builds unity together in our common purpose. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Paul's teaching. We thank you for the Queen's example. And we pray that as we diligently each follow you, we may also each build unity together. Amen. Thank you, Stuart. And as we think about that unity in Christ, let's stand together and say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we are led in our intercessions. Let us bring ourselves to prayer. Shape and colour our prayers today so that they and we may mirror your image. Reveal to us your will and grant us grace and wisdom to know our weaknesses and our strengths. Heavenly Father, as we go through the period of national mourning for the sad loss of the, our Queen, we will pray and reflect on her long and dedicated life in many different ways. Adding to the prayers for her at the start of our service today, we also remember that she has been the only head of state during our lifetimes. With a calming presence and an influence on us all as individuals in a turbulent and ever-changing world during her reign. May her example continue to inspire us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
everlasting God. Following the formal proclamation of the King of St. James Palace yesterday, we now pray for our new King, King Charles III. Bless his future reign and the life of our nation. Help us to work together so that justice and truth, harmony and fairness flourish among us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray for all churches across the nation, especially St. Mary's and St. John's in our parish. We give thanks for the significance and relevance of parish churches at this time as a place for reflection and commemoration to mark the death of the Queen. And we give thanks for the bells and the bell ringers. We pray for Stuart, our vicar, and his family. Pray for our bishops, Mark, Sam, and Julie. We pray for our PCC meeting on Monday. Pray that you would give all those who attend that meeting a clear vision of your will for this parish. We pray at this time for all PCCs as they face decisions on the financing and the stewardship of churches in difficult economic times. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the missions we support, Tear Fund, Christian Solidarity Worldwide, the Church Mission Society, the link with the Congo, Church Pastoral Aid Society, Oasis, and Wellspring. Our prayers this month are focusing on the work of Tear Fund across the world, working in three main ways, through advocacy and influencing, through community development, and through humanitarian response. We do give thanks for all their work in many difficult places, desperately needing help. And we continue today to pray for all the people in Ukraine who are still suffering the turbulence of war. We pray for peace and understanding across the world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks for our community here in Disley Parish, for all the volunteering in groups and societies, providing activities, support, and social interaction for our day-to-day -day well-being, particularly important in this time of mourning, sharing thoughts and memories of the Queen. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we know that your loving concern is for the sick and for the healthy. Give grace to the healthy tending to the sick and to those who are suffering at this time in body, mind or spirit. Just bring before you anyone known to us personally. Comfort them in their distress, heal them of their affliction, and by your saving grace, bless them with eternal joy. We bring before you as well those among our families and friends who have died in the faith of Christ. Fill the emptiness of bereavement with the fullness of your resurrection life, that once again the morning stars may sing together and all the sons of God may shout for joy. And finally, Lord, on this 13th day of Trinity after Sunday, give us more love and more likeness to you. Help us not to judge other people. Help us to love one another. Teach us that it's better to give than to receive. Better to forget ourselves than to put ourselves forward. Better to serve than be waited on. And unto you, the God of love, be praise and glory forever. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, David. And now we stand for our offertory hymn, uh, which is The Lord's My Shepherd.
Yours, Lord, is the goodness, the power, and the splendor. Every good thing comes from you, and of your own do we give you. Amen. 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 And now, whilst we're still standing, uh, we'll say the peace. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share in his peace. The peace of God of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let us share with one another a sign of our love. As you head back towards your places, we are, we are going to uh, share communion. And as we think about unity and that call towards unity and to intentionally strive for it, um, communion is one of those points that uni unites almost all uh, Christian denominations um, uh, together. And as such, as a point of unity, all are welcome, if you wish to, to come and receive uh, communion today. If you wish to receive communion, as I come past, put your hands out uh, to receive communion. If you wish to come up and have a blessing, put your hands behind your back, and I'll know in a prayer prayer our blessing, blessing for you. We have also, uh, since COVID, been taking of single cups, um, just uh, to be that much uh, more conscious for one another uh, and for each other's benefits, so that everybody feels that they can receive of the cup as well. And as we do so, I invite you to take the cup, if you're taking it, and then as you return to your place, there is a little table on um, your right-hand side, the left-hand side as you go down, and just to deposit the empty cup there. Um, I don't think there's any other instructions I particularly need to give you as we flow into the communion service um, together. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now we give you thanks because through him you have given us the hope of a glorious resurrection. So that although death comes to us all, yet we rejoice in the promise of eternal life. For to your faithful people, life is changed, not taken away. And when our mortal flesh is laid aside, an everlasting dwelling place is made ready for us in heaven. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, ever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to you, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the world, 
He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until his com- he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray and grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom. And with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit. Inspire us with your love. And unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. All are welcome to come and receive, if you wish, either communion or a blessing. To receive communion, put your hands out. And if a blessing, put your hands behind. Jesus Christ, which is broken for you, preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Take, eat, and remember that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Father in heaven, whose church on earth is a sign of your heavenly peace, in an image of the new and eternal Jerusalem, grant to us in these days of our pilgrimage that, fed with the living bread of heaven and united in the body of your Son, we may be the temple of your presence, the place of your glory on earth, and a sign of your peace in the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We say together, Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and gave us home. Dying and living, he declared you our love, gave us grace and opened up gates of glory. May we who share Christ's body, may we send us home. We whom the Spirit give light to others. We who the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole world live to praise your name through Christ our Lord. We shared in communion, which is one of those great symbols in the church of our unity. And actually, for those of you that know your theology will know that the two prayers that I say as I'm giving out the bread actually come from the more Catholic and the more Reformed tradition and are a sign of the unity actually in that prayer, as the Anglican Church has often tried to be, a broad church uh, of unity across great difference. Um, and that sort of sense of unity, which we may find in the Queen, that we may find in communion, which we may find in democracy or freedom of speech, even though it has great difference in it, is in our final hymn, as for the church, the great unity comes round Jesus Christ. And we sang, stand and sing the great hymn, uh, number 640, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord.
God grants to the living grace and to the departed rest, to the church, the king, the commonwealth, and all humankind, peace and concord, and to us and all his servants, life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. God save our gracious King, long live our noble King, God save the King. Send him victorious, happy and glorious, Long to reign over us, God save the King. By choices gifts in store, on Him be blessed to pour, long may He And give us ever cause to sing with heart and voice, God save the King. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, bless our sovereign Lord King Charles III and all who are in authority under him that they may order all things in wisdom and equity, righteousness and peace, to the honour of your name and the good of your church and people, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.